I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we conclude our investigation into the death of Maitrese Richardson. Welcome to today's episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Alice. Hey, Brett. Good to hear from you today. It's good to talk to you, too, Alice. Alice is the uh, the calm, zen member of the team. I'm going to try and be more zen today. I feel like I uh, might have might have ranted a little too much. If you guys met us in real life, that would be the funniest comment ever, that I'm the zen one of the two of us. <laughs> well, podcasting isn't real life, so... <laughs> Let's just say, before we turned on the uh, record button today, I was uh, screaming and ranting for about 30 minutes because I could not figure out my microphone. <laughs> for some reason... Today was a challenge. <laughs> I was going to say, for some reason, I'm just like an old person when it comes to technology, and I don't think I'm that old. You would think I would know how to do this. Well... These these are the uh, these are the hurdles we overcome so that we can broadcast to you guys and uh, talk about true crime. We're gonna do that today. We're going to finish our investigation into the death, the tragic death, the avoidable death of Maitrese Richardson. I was gonna defend you for a moment. That that's exactly why I think you were so heated. Um, is because as prosecutors, we do get mad when we see something that could be avoidable. Um, especially when we're talking about someone's life. So I think justified anger is um, absolutely appropriate. Well, that's right, you know, and not to get all rah-rah American flags and everything else, but we're in the justice business and we're in the helping people business. And, you know, the police are supposed to be in that same business. And I think most of the time they do an incredible job but sometimes they fall down on the job and this is one of those instances and i don't really know how you can reach any other conclusion um about that and is you know we talked yesterday about all the things they could have done and didn't do we're going to talk about more things today that they could have done but didn't do and then we'll you know try and reach some sort of conclusions based on the evidence we have compromised though it may be about what happened in this case i do want to start off Two corrections. Number one, uh, the fancy restaurant on the Pacific Coast Highway is actually pronounced Joffrey's, not Jeffrey's, because being fancy, I'm sure Jeffrey's was just too pedestrian. And I know I'm usually the one who can't pronounce things here. I actually thought it was Joffrey's, so you guys don't know that. So I've, I've, I have nothing to back that up. I did think it was Joffrey's. <laughs> <laughs> she did. She did. And I corrected her incorrectly. So anyways, my bad. Uh, the other thing I realized this as I was editing yesterday's podcast, you know, California borders like 27 states, uh, but one of them is not New Mexico. So it is not actually possible for an investigation to travel across the border between California and New Mexico. Can't do that. Arizona's in the way. So just <laughs> wanted to make that correction, show that I do have a little bit of a grasp of geography, not much, uh, about the same amount as pronunciation. But I'm sure, you know, we haven't released these, obviously. I'm sure someone is criticizing me on Twitter, even as we speak in the future, about my New Mexico-California border incident. But in any event, let's dive back in. So as we said yesterday, as we concluded our episode on August 9th, 2010, uh, Rangers headed into Dark Canyon. They're looking at this, this pot farm. They'd eradicated it sometime before. And one of the things they do, I mean, if it was a good place to grow pot before, it's a good place to grow pot 
now. So they want to check and make sure that it's been eradicated and it has remained that way. During this process, they stumble upon uh, Matrice's remains. You know, Latisse, her mother, had never wavered in her belief that Matrice was somewhere in that area. There were false sightings that had occurred up to this point, a couple in Las Vegas. Uh, I think uh, her father had gone out to Las Vegas to look for Matrice. Um, one of her school friends had seen someone that he thought was Matrice. He had called out her name, and this person sort of ran away. And that made people think maybe this is a sex trafficking thing. You know, she got picked up. She was being sex trafficked. She's been taken to Las Vegas. As awful as that is, it also sort of gave hope to the family that maybe Matrice would be found alive. But whether it was intuition or just a recognition of how unlikely that was, Latisse didn't believe it. And unfortunately, she was proven correct. So Dark Canyon, we talked about this before. This is where the dogs had led officers. This was the area that was not searched. It's less than eight miles from the Lost Hills Sheriff Station and within two miles of where Mitrice was last seen. Hey, Brett, can you give us a little more info on this eradicated pot farm? Uh, what do you mean by eradicated? And since this was about 10 years ago, I, I want to set set you know the the scene a little bit for people um do we know who is planting the pot um because it's very different if it's just some kind of 20 something you know guy making his own pot versus say a cartel right and so you're right it's funny how much things have changed since then obviously california has now legalized marijuana and there are legal marijuana grows across the state. Interestingly, though, it is a heavily regulated industry, so now the state has even more incentive to sort of find these illegal pot grows and eliminate them. At the time, they were doing that essentially to all the pot grows. You know, I don't know who was doing this. I've never seen anything about whether this was, like you said, a bunch of 20-year-olds or a cartel. My understanding is that when they did check on the pot grow, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it, it had still been eradicated. There was no evidence that, you know, whoever was doing it had returned. If there had have been, you're right, that's a good, that's a good or an interesting lead because you can imagine sort of my tree stumbling upon this, running into the wrong people. They don't know anything about her, and they just sort of kill her uh, reflexively. You would think if they did that, they would probably take her body somewhere else. Now, it also gives you an idea of how isolated this is. People don't, you know, they don't have their pot grows next to the highway. They have it in a difficult place to find, a difficult place to reach, but not an impossible one. And we're going to talk about this more. There's a lot of discussion about how hard it would be to get there, um, how difficult it was for her family to get there uh, and police and how people had to be helicoptered in and all this other stuff. But I do wonder if maybe... My tree stumbled upon a pathway that other people didn't know about, uh, and that helped her find this. I can't imagine your average pot grower uh, is going to be flying in by a helicopter to harvest their marijuana. I mean, there had to be a an easy way to get in, get that stuff, and get out. So yeah, that's that's sort of the place we're at, isolated, the kind of place where you could feel comfortable growing a bunch of marijuana and think you might not be discovered. So, you know... This is, her body's been out there a long time. There are, how to put this, you know, her body is dispersed, I guess, is one way to put it. You know, you've got scattered belongings, you have hair that's kind of all over the place. Um, they find parts of her remains at, at some distance. And so it's pretty obvious that animals have gotten to this that figuring out what happened to her after all this time is going to be quite difficult. But not impossible. Not impossible. Not if, if the police do the things they're supposed to do, maybe they can figure something out. So Lost Hills deputies, they get to this place about 1.30. That's only about 80 minutes after the rangers have called in what they've found. It's August, so that means we're in the summer. That means you got a lot of daylight left, probably six hours, maybe more. Uh, lots of time to bring in the coroner, to bring in 
the you know the CSI folks. They can do their work. They can take their pictures. They can collect their evidence. But the coroner doesn't get news of this until around three o'clock. So it takes another hour and a half for him to find out about this, and uh, and that's three hours after the Lost Hills Sheriff Department Sheriff's Department has found out about this. And, and Brett, what's the policy for letting the coroner know in a situation like this? In a situation, you need to let the coroner know as soon as possible. I mean, period. There, <laughs> there's, and I and I don't. You know, I haven't read the handbook, of the uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Office, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that it's the same as any other death investigation. You need to get those people out there as soon as possible. And it makes sense because they're the ones who are supposed to get the answers, right? So they need to be there exactly. as soon as possible. Exactly. You know, police officers, they get a lot of training in how to preserve a scene. But at the end of the day... They're preserving it so the coroner can come out, so the experts can come out. There is so much evidence in the place that you find a body. So much. That is going to tell you everything. Not, not everything. I mean, obviously, the autopsy is important, too. But it's going to tell you so much about a crime or whether a crime was committed. The coroner realizes this. They put together a team. They're heading out there. It's around 5 o'clock. And they go to a hillside where a helicopter is supposed to pick them up. It's going to pick them up and it's going to take them to the site. And in fact, some L.A. Sheriff's Department detectives had been taken to the site in a very similar way. So they're hanging out on this hill. And nearly two hours have passed. And nobody's come to pick them up. And the Sheriff's Department says, sorry, you know, our helicopter got diverted. We had to go look for a lost hiker. I don't know if the Sheriff's Department, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, only had one helicopter. A little unclear. But now, the sun's going down. It's 8 o'clock. What are we going to do? And everybody in the coroner's office just assumes, okay, well, we'll come back in the morning. And this is not a crazy thought, right? Well, we're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You're in the middle of nowhere. The body's been there for months. It can wait till tomorrow morning but uh the los angeles sheriff's department just bathing themselves in glory <laughs> decides eh, let's just go ahead and collect the remains and airlift them out so that mysterious helicopter that couldn't be found why brett why <laughs> i really have to ask why for i mean can you imagine a situation where this is appropriate? They're not the ones tasked with collecting remains. They don't know the proper procedures, right? Literally, it is a state law, a state law that the body, quote, shall not be disturbed or moved from the position or place of death without permission of the coroner or the coroner's appointed deputy. So what's the, I mean, what's the recourse? You know, uh, I know these laws exist and I, it's, it could not be stated more clearly that the coroner needs to give permission here. And they don't even tell, they don't even pretend to ask for permission here. I don't know if they're going to ask for forgiveness later, but I mean, is there any recourse here? No. <laughs> and that's mean... what's so frustrating, right? Even though there's a law and people yeah. should abide by it, I, I don't even know who would have you know, like what that legal proceeding would look like, because the purpose of the law is not to create uh, causes of action for you to be able to litigate. The purpose of the law is because it is best practices for purposes of determining cause of death. And if it's a crime scene to collect evidence necessary to resolve the case. Right. The expectation is not that you're going to need some sort of some sort of enforcement mechanism to get the sheriff's department to follow the law. I mean, fair enough. <laughs> it's the whole thing. It's this is a and I'm I'm even sorry to laugh because all this is so serious, but it's one of those you got to laugh not to cry circumstances or to scream because just nothing they've done from the very beginning makes any sense. And look, I don't know whether somebody from the sheriff's office killed my trees or not. That's what some people think. I don't think there's some grand conspiracy. I mean, the Los Angeles the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office is like an army. It's huge. It's massive. It's just a massive entity. Um, I just think there was so much incompetence. And I do think, I will say this, and I, I hate to get ahead of myself, but 
I don't know about some conspiracy to cover up like a murder within the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, but I do kind of feel like that the sheriff's office thought we had this crazy girl coming to our office and now she's gone and gotten herself killed and it's going to get us in all kinds of trouble. Let's just sweep this under the rug as quickly as possible and get rid of this. So you got this coroner's team on standby for six hours. And meanwhile, the sheriff's office is lifting the body out, despite the fact that it's their job. It's their job to protect the crime scene. And can we also note that they can't find a helicopter to get the coroner down there, but they can find a helicopter to lift the body out. Yeah. And like I said, we don't believe in conspiracies generally. We trust the police generally. This is a case that makes you want to just go to rule number 10, which is the extraordinary cases, extraordinary things happen, and just throw it all out. Because they do so many things throughout this case that it's almost hard to believe it wasn't intentional, right? It's almost a hard, it's almost hard to believe that they could be this incompetent. And sure enough, you know, Sheriff Baca, who, spoiler alert, eventually ends up being prosecuted for corruption, uh, comes out, not unrelated to this case, uh, comes out and says, no indication of homicide at this point. Um, and, and I love this. I love this part. I don't believe that the remains are capable of telling us a story. Well, now they're not. Not when you sweep them into a bag and put them onto, uh, onto the, uh, you know, uh, helicopter. Of course not. And what was he, what was he, um, ultimately convicted of in terms of, um, you know, there was some, I would have to look into it. I don't remember exactly. I, I can't remember if it was, I mean, it was some, it was some sort of corruption in the office, but I can't remember if it was about money or about prisoner treatment or what I'd have to look. It was a huge deal when it happened because once again, the Los Angeles sheriff is a big deal. It's a big job. But I do know, like I said, that he eventually was indicted and convicted. And look, somebody needs to write a book. If you're out there and you're somebody who likes to do research and you'd like to write, someone should just write a book on the corruption of the LAPD in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department over really the last hundred years because it's essentially unbelievable. I mean, the stories, the stories about the LAPD in the LA County Sheriff's Office, I mean, essentially every law enforcement conspiracy that you've ever heard about kind of comes from the fact that they probably were doing it in the LAPD uh, at one point or another <laughs> and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Two books you can read that sort of veer into conspiracy territory, but are based in fact, um, one is the Black Dahlia Avenger, which is about George Hodel and the speculation by his son that George Hodel killed the Black Dahlia. Far more interesting than that is he sort of dives into this. Now, that book's way too long and way too repetitive. It could be done better. Um, there's another book, the name of it escapes me, but it's, it's by a reporter, I think for the New Yorker, but I could be wrong about what publication he was working for, but he was writing this long form investigation into the Manson family and he ends up in all sorts of kind of weird conspiracy places about the CIA and everything else. But one thing he does as well is he sort of talks about the Los Angeles police department in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's office. So all this to say this is not new for them, <laughs> but this is really, it's like, it's like a perfect storm of incompetence descends on this case. And, you know, don't take our word for it. An LAPD detective actually said, you know, quote, law enforcement's job is to protect the crime scene. You never move a body without permission. And he says about what happened here on August 9th, it just sounds, quote, ass backwards. That's 100% right. I just thought that was, you can't say it more clearly than that. No, and that's, that's one of their own people saying that. So at this point, things, things are going from bad to worse. Um, and at some point, the family actually brings in their own person to take a look at this, review what both the police and the coroner's office, because the coroner's office is now about to appear you know, despite the fact that they were not allowed to do their job initially. Now they do have the body. And there's some real questions about what they did. And so the family hired someone, and I actually don't know if they hired her or she did it voluntarily. Her name is Clea Koff. 
very well respected person, uh, former United Nations forensic anthropologist, member of the FBI's scientific working scientific working groups. Um, somebody, one of these people who travels to other countries where there are genocides and things like that, and determines causes of death. And, and makes determinations that are, you know, both really important for international criminal purposes, but also often involve crimes that happened a long time ago, could be years that have passed. So exactly the kind of person that you want looking at something like this, where the body's been out in the elements for months. And when she looked at what the coroner's office had done, she had a lot of questions. Absolutely. And she and she's just um, pointing out some of the things that they should have done. For example, uh, you know, Koff held a press conference in December of 2010 after um, reviewing uh, the remains. And she said, you know, the coroner's office really didn't take the full complement of actions that were available to them over the course of their examination. Um, and she start, she starts with the hair on Matrice's head. Um, it wasn't, ex you know, Brett had noted earlier that the remains were, were, were scattered, um, and so hair was found in multiple locations, and it wasn't clear if the hair that was still on uh, Matrice's head matched the hair that was scattered around the area where her remains were scattered. Um, you know, is that someone else's hair? Ha had it been cut off, uh, or was that just the result of animals... Um, uh, uh, you know, kind of getting to the remains. It's not clear. And that could be a lot of great DNA evidence. If you have other DNA, other uh, people's hair mixed in, that can give you a great lead as to what may have happened here. Um, here. Here's a big question too that she noted. There were these metallic fragments and an earring in the detached hair, but this was not an earring that Matrice was wearing at the time of her arrest. And it, it wasn't even sent to the crime lab. So if you remember previously, we know what Matrice had on her. Um, very limited things. Uh, everything else was left in her car when she left. So this earring is not associated with her. Where did it come from? Whose is it? Uh, these are questions you would absolutely, you know, it's like a forensics 101 sort of question you would want to know the answer to. But they neglected to even send it to the crime lab. Um, here's, here's another interesting thing from the forensics, uh, viewpoint. There were, understandably, because Matrice's body was uh, outside in the elements, bug casings, bug egg casings on her body. Um, and bug egg casings can tell you a lot about the timing of when those, uh, eggs were laid and hatched, uh, and can give you an idea of timing of when the body got there. Um, but those casings were not tested to determine if, you know, at the time that those flies may have hatched or if it's even consistent with the environment in which it was found. Um, this can really help narrow down the time and place where she died. If someone had killed her somewhere and then dumped her body there, these egg casings can reveal something about that. But that wasn't done. Again, because she was in the elements, there was a lot of dirt and leaves um, mixed in with the remains, but they weren't tested for blood. Uh, that again can tell you uh, the circumstances of uh, her death. There was no craniotomy uh, performed to look for evidence of trauma. There was still pubic hair that was present on her remains, but shockingly, and this is really shocking because she was found naked. They did not comb the pubic hair for um, foreign fibers, other uh, people's hairs, or they, they didn't even test it for semen. I find this particularly shocking just because of the state that she's found in. We've mentioned in other podcasts that, um, uh, I believe in the Lisa Lamb episodes, that you typically do kind of like a rape kit um, testing when you find a body in this condition naked because you, you don't know if you're ultimately going to need it, but you have to take it as close in time as the find as, you know, when, when the event occurred here, we know she's been out in the elements, but it seems like a pretty reasonable step to, to look for any sort of sexual trauma because of her state, but that wasn't done here. Also, they didn't test uh, for those, you know, foreign fibers or bodily fluids of other people on her clothing, which was Again, not on her body, but in the scene. 
In fact, for several weeks, the coroner didn't even know where Mitrice's clothing was. When Koff was uh, examining the the body bag, she actually found Mitrice's clothes stuffed at the bottom of the body bag, which is seemingly an appalling oversight. Um, you would think you would look at everything in the body bag, but somehow these clothes were overlooked by the coroner. And now when Koff actually looked at Mitrice's um, uh, remains, she did notice that Mitrice's teeth appeared to be slightly pink. And now, uh, again, without more testing, it's not clear what that means, but typically uh, if it could be a sign of strangulation when um, the remains of uh, the teeth are, are pink. But they can't really tell if strangulation was even um, a, a possibility here because the coroner hasn't recovered the... Uh, the hyoid. The hyoid bone. bone the hyoid bone. Yeah, the, the <laughs> neck bone, which is where uh, it is in your neck. And typically it's, uh, it can show trauma if there's been a strangulation. If the coroner were trying to rule that out, you would think that they would ask or try to scour the area to look for that particular bone um, because they did have a second search of the area, but they they didn't find it. And I don't know that they in particular were looking for the, the neck bone. And I should also note that second search didn't even happen until six months after the remains were found. Um, because the coroner wasn't there at the the discovery of the remains, you would think that they'd want to get back down there themselves immediately um, to make sure that the the police had done a thorough job of collecting all of the remains. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. They didn't do a thorough job of collecting the remains. There were things left behind. And you would think if it was so urgent to get her body down that day that they would have immediately conducted additional searches, but they don't. And it just makes you wonder... Why was it so important to move her body that day? You know, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. And look, we know they didn't do a good job. And we know that. And this is, you know, one of those yet another infuriating facts about this case. Um, her family eventually goes up to that site to sort of build a little memorial to their daughter and while they're doing that, they find one of her finger bones in the dirt. So, can we just talk about how devastating yeah. that is for them? <laughs> I, know. I mean, I just can't. And it just makes you think that hyoid bone is probably just sitting in the dirt somewhere. And the reason that's so important, like you said, Patrice was naked. We're probably not going to be able eight months later to determine whether or not she was sexually assaulted, particularly given the state of the body. But sexual assault victims like this are often strangled to death. Um, and the hyoid bone is critical to being able to determine that. But, of course, we don't have it, and so we're not going to know that. And it gets worse, you know, just to just sort of like rattle off some things they did, you know, they didn't take pictures of the scene, which is investigation 101. They didn't take, you know, pictures of where her body was found uh, or the recovery process. They didn't collect any soil samples. Um, the body was just, you know, thrown in this bag and the coroner has no idea how it got there. And the crazy thing about this is the rangers, the rando people who were just looking to see whether or not there was a marijuana grow, they took pictures of the site. So the only pictures we have are the few that they took, but the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, who deals with this kind of thing every day. That's another thing, right? Like lots of time you're dealing with some police department that hasn't seen a murder in 25 years or whatever, and they're assigning you know, the narcotics guy to it. Cause he's the, he's the best criminal investigator they've got. And he has no idea what he's doing. These guys do know they should have known. They should have been able to do this in a way that makes sense. I'm not going to go through all of it, but eventually there was an investigation that the, the sheriff's department conducted on itself, uh, about all this. I bet I bet you can. I bet you can figure out how that went. Um, they pointed out all their flaws, right? Of course, flaws, they, right? they found that they did everything perfectly. <laughs> yeah, 
Exactly. But it was interesting. You know, there were some emails from deputies there um, that a few days after she disappeared saying things like, yeah, the whole reason she was brought in is because she was acting strangely and she shouldn't have been released. Um, that kind of thing. But in general, what Lost Hills did was everything they did uh, backed up their decision, right? So you have the witnesses at Joffrey's who are talking about how she was acting. And you've got what the detectives, or not the detectives, but what the sheriff's officers who were on the scene saw and the weird things they thought she was doing. And then all of a sudden, according to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, when she gets to the Lost Hill Station, she's just perfect. Right. And there's no indication that she has any problems whatsoever. And of course, they should have released her. Uh, eventually, the family gets hold of some video uh, that was taken inside the Lost Hills Sheriff's Department. And it shows things. And, and this took months, months. This was one of those things where the Sheriff's Department said they couldn't find it or they're having technological difficulties and all this other stuff. And eventually they, they got a hold of it. And basically, you see Matrice doing things like, you know, holding onto the bars, like she's trying to get out and, and just looking like she's in a, in a disturbed state. It also appears that the video is edited. There are things that seem like they're missing. At one point, she's holding a piece of paper. The next second, the piece of paper is balled up on the ground. How the piece of paper get that way? Hey, Brett, let, let me break in real quick based on kind of our experience. And I think I know what the answer is. Typically, when you get these sort of um, rote videos from jailhouses or from dash cam, you know, the police, basically, do you get a nicely edited, write exactly the type of evidence you need for your case? Or do you get a sprawling hours long video where you have to sit there for hours and figure out what's important in it? Which of those do you get? Yeah. You get a sprawling <laughs> hours long. You know video. why? Because it's nobody takes right, the time to because edit it's things. it's easier to just download <laughs> the whole thing and send it off. I would love it if um, from the police we got something that was very targeted to my case, so I didn't have to sit through hours of basically probably nothing happening, looking for a thirty second uh, clip that I need. And so the fact that someone went in to edit this, I think, is also uh, interesting because that's just in my experience typically not what uh, I get, something something edited. And it's also interesting that the sheriff's department doesn't give a reason for this, right? Like, they've always refused to say. So you could imagine a scenario in which there's another individual in the video or there's something that they need to edit for privacy reasons or whatever, um, but they don't give any of that kind of explanation. Like everything else they do, they're, they do not help themselves. Um, there, there could be a perfectly innocent explanation for this, but you would never know it from the way the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department is acting. And another thing that's fueled endless speculation is as Matrice is leaving the station, a deputy is also leaving the station. We don't know who that deputy is. We don't know if that deputy had any interaction with Matrice. I mean, they're literally leaving like right at the same time. And, you know, in a case like this, with a, with a death like this, there have been a lot of people who've wondered, if you do have a bad cop, I mean, what are, you know, what are the chances that you're both a cop and a serial killer or whatever? But they obviously would see this as an opportunity. We've talked about this before, how people who are predators, they look for prey. My Therese is in a very bad state. She needs help, frankly. So you could imagine this, you know, the sheriff's, deputy if they were a bad guy saying something like hey i'll give you a ride and then you know the rest goes the way you would think it would go if you believe in you know that that the, there was actual involvement by someone in the sheriff's department in my Teresa's disappearance and death so just want to give you a quick timeline we've talked about this a lot. There's been a lot of ranting in these two episodes. <laughs> I apologize for that. It's just difficult to talk about this case in any kind of structured way because so much happens that's wrong and infuriating and disturbing. And it's just, it's, it's hard to deal with this case the way we deal with most of our cases. So just sorry about that. Bear with us, but timeline. So it's September 16th, 2009, at around 9.50, Matrice is arrested 
Sometime after 10 p.m., her mother calls Lost Hills and is told Matrice will not be released that night. I mean, frankly, ordinarily, you get arrested at 10 o'clock at night, you're spending a night in jail. I mean, just the processing uh, is going to take basically the rest of the night. And I think this is probably sort of good law gone bad. I'm sure that California was trying to ensure that people who were arrested for very low level crimes did not have to spend a night in jail for that very reason. And that, you know, kind of unintended consequence was she got rushed out and the only way to keep her would be to take that extra step as we talked about yesterday and address the sort of mental issues she was having. In any event, her mother's told she won't be released. At 12.15, she's released. At 5.30, her mother calls, finds out that Matrice is no longer there. An hour later, at 6.30, we get the call from Bill Smith, reports a prowler who is almost certainly Matrice. That's about six miles from the station, as we talked about yesterday, right at the bottom of Dark Canyon. And then... Nearly a year later, August 9th, 2010, 1220, the Rangers find the body. 140, Sheriff's Office arrives. 3 o'clock, the coroner is notified. Two hours later, coroner's officials are still waiting to be airlifted to the site. And the, the LSSD detectives are on their way in right around then. Don't know why the coroners couldn't have caught a flight with them. And then at 8 p.m., the remains are taken. Hey, Brett, you know, we've talked a lot about how they needed helicopters to get in, but presumably Mitrice did not have a helicopter to get into the Dark Canyon. So how do you have any sense of how long or how treacherous it would be to hike down there? So the way that her family went in was incredibly treacherous. I mean, it was basically like a full on hiking expedition. I mean, they've got climbing harnesses and ropes and helmets and all this other stuff. And it was a very difficult trek. And that's actually one reason that Latisse has maintained that she thinks her daughter was murdered because she just doesn't, she can't imagine how her daughter could have gotten up there in presumably a weakened state. I mean, she's walked six miles from the Lost Hills Sheriff's Department by the time she reaches Bill Smith's house. She's tired. We know she's tired. She tells him, I'm resting. What made her wander into the canyon i don't know based on the footprints and the dogs and everything else it seems like she did wander into that canyon it is exceedingly difficult to imagine how she could end up where she did that's why it makes me wonder if there is just an easier path that we don't know about that the folks who are running that marijuana grow know about and that's the path she took. She didn't hike up the way her family went. I just don't even know how that's possible. I don't even, I don't know how she would physically be able to do it. You would it. think that with like a third, I don't know how third it is, but with more than one search for remains, someone would have stumbled upon that other path though, right? I mean, she, like you said, she's in a weakened state. It was maybe dark at that time. It, it, maybe the sun was starting to come up, but it's not like she's this experienced hiker. In fact, I don't think she's a hiker at all. Um, and for her to find this path, you would think someone else could have been able to spot it in all this time searching. You would think, but I've never heard, I have never heard an explanation. And if somebody out there knows it, and if somebody out there is aware of this path, you know, sometimes in cases like this, and we talked about this a little bit with Brian Schaefer, I just always wonder if there is a part of the story that's left out that would just take a little bit away from the mystery and so people don't like to talk about it um and so maybe there is a path and somebody knows that and they're like hey this is how she did it like ignore all the noise this is how she did it she followed this path up to this point and maybe maybe even it's one of those things i mean we don't know how she died <laughs> the sheriff's office has all these ridiculous uh, speculations that maybe she had an adverse reaction to poison ivy or something. I think more than likely she ended up there and starved to death or just died from exposure. I think poison ivy is unlikely. I don't know if it's one of those things where she could have fallen into this place. Like she could have been higher up and sort of fallen in and maybe the rain or, or you know, there, 
they're washes that go through here. It's California. You know how it is. Every time it rains in California, half the state slips off a mountain. So I don't know if it's one of those things where she could have been carried into this position or not. And <laughs> how can we ever know? Right? Like we, we just don't know anything and we don't know anything because all of the anthropological investigation that could have been done by the coroner's office to tell us how her body got there was never done and can never be done. And that is lost forever. And because it's lost forever, I think we can speculate about this, but I don't know how we can ever reach any kind of conclusion. That's kind of, that's kind of depressing, Brett. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this whole case is depressing. This is, this is, you know, at least a lamb is depressing. We talked about how that one was depressing for a lot of reasons. This one is like compounded by, as I've said several times now, how avoidable this tragedy was. Um, you know, the only good thing that came out of this was Matrice's family did sue the sheriff's department and did win a judgment, though only of around nine hundred thousand dollars. I think they deserved a lot more than that. I mean, I think they reached a settlement, but. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's just disaster on top of disaster. And Matrice was someone who needed help. Uh, we know that in the days leading up to this, her behavior had become more unusual, more alarming, more inexplicable. She was sending text messages to her mom that said really strange things. Her mom, her mom reached out to her and was concerned about her, was concerned about her state, thought she might be de depressed, thought she might be suicidal. Matrice replied, Quote, I'm writing a book because you told me I can be anything I wanted. You told me I was Miss America. You told me I was America's next top model. Now do you know what I want to be when I grow up? Miss Mother Nature, because Miss America is a fake-ass joke along with everything else we see. So I'm trying to find my way to Michelle Obama to see if she will talk to Mr. Obama about creating my position within the White House. And that's the kind of, I, I have seen text messages, phone calls, videos of people in the cases that we have handled that are like that, where the person clearly has lost connection with the reality. It's pretty common actually to, to want to talk to the president. I don't, I don't know if it's always been that way or if just our sort of social media world we live in, you get that a lot. Her mother, you know, begged my trees to call her. So they could talk about this. And she responded, I feel joy, mommy. Not everyone has to die to live. I heard in the Bible, Jesus dies so we can live forever. Now I have to prove the unlogic, which you can imagine how statements like that would bother her mother. I, I mean, a as a mother, I would be so terrified for my daughter if I'm getting these sorts of text messages, much less, you know, as a prosecutor seeing that, um, this type of evidence, you just know something is really wrong. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And for the sheriff's office to try and act now, like my Therese was in this perfect, usual, nothing, nothing alarming at all from my Therese while she was in the, in the jail is just completely unbelievable. I, I mean, and I've said this earlier, I don't believe anything they say. So Anything they say about her state of mind while she was there, I think we can assume is a lie. We can assume is, is just a cover up to try and avoid, you know, like I said, I don't think they murdered her. I think they're trying to cover their ass about basically. Um, they're trying to avoid liability. They're trying to avoid getting fired. Like I said, I don't think you can believe any of it. I think she was in the grips of a full on psychotic break when this happened and and going back to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, like how did she get there? I mean, that is one thing people, we talked about this before, people who are in the grip of this kind of mental state can do things that you just would never imagine and that are not like them. Uh, Latisse talks a lot about how, about how Matrice did not like the outdoors, that she can't imagine her doing this because it's not something she would ever do. Like hiking is the last thing she wants to do. But I just don't think we can apply that kind of logic to her. And, you know, we, we've, we've been pretty clear in our first podcast episode and in uh, our discussions of the police that if there's no reason to suspect the police, we're not going to be hard on them. But here, I think the reason we're so hard on them is because evidence after evidence is showing us that they are, they are just completely mishandling this case. And that is to put it lightly, we're not even importing malice 
you know, yet. Um, because here's the thing, not only, you know, Brett already mentioned this, not only does the LAPD, uh, the LASD deal with high profile cases all the time, we know they're capable of acting better. Remember this, you know, this is a, a police station that drove Mel Gibson, at, you know, after he got his uh, uh, arrest for drinking while driving. Um, so they're capable of kind of rolling out the red carpet for at least a famous person. So why, why didn't they drive my trees somewhere? You know, they know that the, the station is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, if they're letting her go, they know she has to be walking in the dark in the middle of nowhere with no open businesses and no one to help her. Um, and that is a very small thing they could have done. So it's, it's unclear why they didn't do something like that. Yeah. And it's one of those things. I don't know if there was a change in policy after that, where sort of like I was saying earlier about unintended consequences, maybe that came out and they had a new rule. You can't drive people home. I think that's giving them probably way too much credit. I think the reason they didn't. It was because Mel Gibson is famous and he's white and he's not Latisse or excuse me, my who I'm sure, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they just saw her. I mean, they, they, based on the way they treated her, I mean, they treated her like trash, right? That's how they treated her. And I'm sure they saw her as just, you know, not someone that they had to take one extra minute out of their day to take care of. Um, so I think at the end of the day, that's what they did. We were talking earlier about how you could get to the canyon, whether there's a, a different way. There is one other way that I have heard about. I've never seen this confirmed, and I wonder how much of this is true. But apparently there was a ranch where the uh, porn films were made, essentially, like a porn ranch. Um, <laughs> and it sat on top of the canyon, and there have been reports that there was a path from this ranch down to the creek bed where my trees was found so obviously people have speculated that maybe the ranch had something to do with it there are people who claim that there were screams held screams heard in the area in the nights after my trees was missing never been able to confirm that never found any confirmation of it um normally i would say that the police would have investigated this lead and would have ruled out the ranch by now since it's the most obvious place to look. But because it's this case, I can't say that. So who knows? Maybe the ranch does have something to do with it. But, you know, this just sets the scene for me a little bit more. Here we have a porn ranch uh, at the top of the canyon. And then at the bottom of the canyon is a, at the time, a uh, you know, a legal pot farm that's been eradicated, but needs to be checked on because has the potential of, uh, you know, reviving. It's setting the scene for me that this is pretty remote and also a known place for people to go do things that um, may not uh, want to see the light of day. Right. And that's what kills me about this case. I mean, you've got the, the Los Angeles Sheriff's, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department has an answer for everything, right? They let her go because she wasn't acting bizarrely. She was undressed because she was in some sort of, you know, mental state where she took off her clothes herself. Um, the reason the clothes are dispersed is because of animals or because of rainwater. Uh, the reason that her body is in pieces is because of animals. Um, even though... There's not a lot of evidence on the body itself of any kind of animal predation. So let's talk a little bit about what we do have. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier that the uh, police officers who uh, recovered her body did not document by photo the crime scene. Uh, but what we do have um, are the photos taken by the rangers who first stumbled upon her. Now, these images have never been disclosed or uh, publicly discussed, so we only know what's in those pictures secondhand. I, I really don't like this. Um, I don't like to talk about evidence secondhand, but this is the best we have here. Obviously, this is not good enough to take to court. Um, but there is a well-placed source who um, has seen these photos, and this person says that, like many facets of Mitrice's case, these pictures just generate more questions than they answer. 
So what's described uh, in these photos is that Mitrice's right leg is caked in soil and it's sprouting weeds. And it's sitting about two yards upslope from her body on top of a mound of dry vines. And the femur of the leg has also been removed from the soft tissue. And it's kind of like it's been pulled from the top of the thigh. And there's nothing but a narrow duct where the bone should have been. And what's interesting is the leg doesn't bear any signs that it's been ravaged by animals. Um, and we would expect maybe something like that. Maybe an animal dragged that um, bone away from the, you know, the rest of the remains. But even the placement of where uh, the leg is found is uh, a little bit questionable because normally if animals are going to be pulling um, bones away, uh, they normally drag them downhill rather than uphill because you can imagine going downhill is a path of least resistance. It's easier. Uh, the animals aren't trying to make more work for themselves. Now, a Lieutenant Michael Rosen supervised the investigators on the LASD's behalf. And on October, uh, in October 2010, this is two months after her remains were airlifted out of the canyon, uh, Lieutenant Rosen met with Latisse, Koff, Sheriff Baca, and a few others to talk about the case. At this time, Rosen explained that the deputies were given permission from a coroner staffer. Now, he didn't say that they got permission from Assistant Chief Winter at the coroner's office. They, he just said some staffer to move the skull and assess what was underneath um, the leaf debris and dirt. And Rosen said, quote, at that point in time, when deputies moved the skull, the whole skeleton remains intact, came up with the skull. And what he says is uh, corroborated by uh, his supervisor, Captain David Smith, who said, quote, when we started removing some of those remains, the entire skeleton came up out of the ground. The skull was still attached to the skeletal remains. This is a little bit confusing because what Rosen and Smiths are saying about the skull being still um, intact when it came out just does not comport with um, the source's description of the photos of Mitrice's remains when it was found. The source says that Mitrice's skull was actually fully detached from the neck and resting upside down without its mandible, the jaw, on the upper torso. A result, this source says, of gravity or maybe nudging by curious animals or someone doing that. And five of the neck bones weren't even recovered that day. Remember, we can't, we haven't even found the um, neck bone yet to see if she was strangled. So it seems to completely contradict what Rosen and Smith have said that the, the neck, uh, the neck was attached to the skull. For me, it's just hard to believe that the entire skeleton could come out of the ground intact after it's been sitting there decomposing for quite some time. It just doesn't seem probable. In fact, it kind of seems impossible. Um, and may explain why a lot of the neck bones weren't found all at once. I mean, in my mind, I'm imagining, based on what Rosen and Smith are saying, that you take the skull and you pull it out of the dirt, kind of like a cartoon, and it goes bloop, 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 and all the little neck bones and vertebrae come up perfectly. But again, based on the decomposition of uh, Mitrice's body, it just doesn't seem uh, possible. He's either mistaken or he's lying. I mean, this is all there is to it. I mean, to pull it out more than a year later when parts of her remains are sprouting weeds, it just seems to defy logic. Yeah, and look, there were parts of her body that were mummified, which in of itself is unusual. Not exactly sure how that happened. Um, but it doesn't seem, I mean, obviously her skull and her neck were not mummified. So I, it if... <laughs> like you said, if the way they describe it is true, where are the neck bones? Where's the hyoid bone? Um, why do we not have those? Yeah, and like why were different parts of her body decomposing at different uh, rates or uh, in different ways? Part of her body was mummified. Another part, you know, was uh, seemed to be decomposing as if in the elements. It just doesn't make sense um, that different parts of her body would be doing that. And And, you know, wasn't there, there was something else about her arm and in fact uh when 
uh, she was found, her left arm was mummified and tightly flexed against her chest as if she was saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, Koff said that the way the arm was flexed could not have been created by environmental conditions where the body was found. Rather, um, I think what usually causes this sort of flexed position in a mummified uh, remains is that it may indicate that her arm was held in place maybe by a sheet a sheet or some other wrapping in a different environment to allow the mummification to set in. It just, I, I mean, that may mean that she was uh, abducted and killed and uh, killed somewhere else and then dumped at a later point into the canyon. What it sounds like happened to me was somebody grabbed her and held her for a while and did unspeakable things to her and at some point killed her, stored her body somewhere and then dumped it in the canyon. Um, I think that ma that makes a lot more sense than what we're hearing. I mean, she's naked. So they didn't find all of her clothes, number one, which, once again, why would they? Because it's not like they did a very good search. Um, so her sneakers are missing. Now, recall that when she, the police actually went to Dark Canyon, they could follow her sneaker prints for a while. So at least up to that point, she still had her, her shoes on, her socks are missing. Um, you know, they did, they did find her jeans, her belt and her bra, but the, the belt was not in the jeans. It was actually removed from the jeans, which once again, animals didn't do that. I think we can totally eliminate that. Don't know many animals that take the belt out of the jeans. So that you could imagine her taking her jeans off, though you wonder if she were going to do that and she were in this state, why she wouldn't just, you know, unzip them and pull them off. Why is she taking her belt out? You know, she's got, she got the bra unhooked and off. Once again, she could have done that, I guess. But if, if like, imagine that what you're thinking is that she took her clothes off and sort of neatly arranged them and then the elements scattered them a bit, you know, where are her shoes? Her shoes would be the things you would think would be exactly where she left them, right? They're heavy. Yeah, so what I think, what it seems like happened to me was essentially, if I had to guess, if I had to guess, that they took her clothes. If you're imagining what I said happened, happened. They sort of dump her, they take her clothes, maybe they throw them in the creek, uh, the creek dries up, and so we've got some clothes left behind. Some of them got carried away. Maybe they kept some as souvenirs. It's hard to say, once again, because we just have so, we have so little to go on other than sort of speculation and the state of her body, because that's all the evidence we have. And another thing about the clothes, I mean, people have said, and I don't know if this is true or not, that basically the clothes were in perfect shape. So, you know, I mean, some people have said that you could, that you could, you could wear those clothes if you wanted to. And that's a really interesting image of how good of a state her clothes were in, that you could essentially wash them and wear them. And, you know, talking about her clothes, okay, I can maybe imagine her taking off her clothes if she had a psychotic break. Um, but her shoes, I, I don't know about that because we've talked about how difficult it is to hike to the area that she was ultimately found in. And even if she were taking off her clothes, and I pause, I get that it's difficult to take off pants without taking off your shoes, but then her feet would be bare and she'd have to navigate this difficult terrain in bare feet. I just don't think she could have gotten this far into the canyon on bare feet on her own, uh, on her own volition. And I think that just points to someone putting her there. You know, I, I do think she met with ill will. I'm not saying that's the police. We just honestly have no idea because this investigation was so botched. Um, but I think someone put her there uh, because of the the way her body was kind of dumped there. And again, I just don't think she could get very far with bare feet in the canyon. But once again, <laughs> without without a better crime scene analysis, it's so difficult to say what's going on. But at the end of the day, you're right. This is obviously a sketchy area that this young woman was wandering through in the middle of the night in a mental state where who knows what she would do if she stumbled upon a couple of like cartel members, like you were saying, or shady sex traffickers heading up to the porn ranch, she probably would have just walked right up to them, said something crazy. You know, she'd already offered 
to pay for her food was sex. So she she could she could have said something like that. Frankly, I don't think she would even have to say something depending on I know she wouldn't have to say something depending on the kind of person she came upon. And there is so much possibility here that she was murdered, right? I feel like a lot of people they look at this case and they just discount from the beginning that she was murdered. She wandered 6 miles from the sheriff's station. She was in a strange mental place. So obviously she wandered up into Dark Canyon. She died of exposure. And maybe that's the most likely thing. I mean, maybe that's the most likely thing that happened. But Maitrese and her family deserve a better investigation. And there have been calls for a new investigation that have have been growing louder and louder uh, over the years. And frankly, I don't care how many times they investigate this case, they should do it again because they they made their bed here and they got to lie in it. Her family and my trees deserve more than they got in the initial investigation. So I don't care if you do think it's a waste of time and it's a waste of money and a waste of resources. It's not. It's not. She deserves that. And I hope they will do further investigations. And I hope that maybe, I don't know how they can ever reach this conclusion, <laughs> but I hope maybe they can eventually give the family some kind of answers. There's just so much we don't know. We can't jump to any conclusions because the evidence just isn't there. But this, this case just makes me so sad. I mean, that's, that's the best word I can use to describe it. Yeah, yeah. And look, like you said, it's a weird place. There were weird things going on in Malibu around then. That around then, there are other people who have been found dead in strange circumstances. Some people think there's a serial killer active. I actually don't think that's probably the case. But once again, you can't rule anything out in this case. And the reason we talk about this, and we talked about it, we've talked about it in every case we've done. People occasionally will say things like, well, until you have an answer, anything's possible. And that is not true. Um, and if you want to reach truth in any of these cases, one of the hard things you have to do is actually eliminate possibilities. Normally, in a case like this, you hear, you've hear you heard our cases, normally we would walk through the possible things that could have happened to her and using evidence and using the facts, we would apply those to those possibilities and we would start eliminating them. You can't do that here. And the reason you can't do that here is because the investigation is so shoddy and so compromised that I just, I don't know... This is not Brian Schaefer, where you can't reach a conclusion because it doesn't seem like anything's possible. This is, everything is possible because we have no way to eliminate uh, any, any of the, of the various theories that people have put together. I mean, here's the thing. I think this, this case has been covered a good bit. Uh, I feel like it's it's getting covered more as the as the parents are calling for more of an investigation. If she was murdered, there's probably somebody who knows about it. There's probably other than the murderer. Um, there's probably somebody who has some notion that that happened. And I think the only thing that we can hope is that if that person is listening to this podcast or watching a documentary, or if there is another investigation that they will come forward and have the information we need to figure this out. This is not a case that's going to be solved by forensics because the police ruined that. Um, so really the only hope we have is a confession. Right. I just don't think we're going to make any headway on this case unless someone says something, if they know something. And, you know, we've described this Dark Canyon, um, you know, it's site to this eradicated pot farm and also a porn ranch, apparently. And these are probably not the type of people who uh, typically want to speak to law enforcement. And I get that because they probably have, there's probably some dirt on them that they don't want to bring the light to law enforcement. But for the sake of my trees, I do hope if they know something, they heard something that night, they know what happened to her, that they say something. And maybe someday one of those people will be picked up on like a small time drug offense and they'll say, I got something for you. And that'll be how this, this mystery is, is solved. Um, and it is a tragedy and it is, it was completely avoidable. Uh, 
And yeah, I mean, I don't know if my Therese was murdered or not, but I know there were some bad guys in this story and they worked at the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. You know, I, I will say something here. Uh, I think you, you guys have heard a lot of emotion in our voices when we talk about this case and our frustration. And, you know, that's not, um, we're not putting that on. Um, we, f we really feel that way about this case because I can't speak for every prosecutor, but I know for me, the reason I do this job is, um, you know, for the victims, for uh, the rule of law, um, upholding that in our society, um, because things tend to crumble when you don't have rule of law. And I know prosecutors um, and law enforcement often get a bad rep that they just want um, a win or um, to flex their power in some way. But I mean, the reason I know Brett and I do this job is because we're truly trying to seek justice. And in this case, I don't think justice was delivered whatsoever to my Therese or her family. Yeah, this was when Alice and I decided to do this podcast. This was one of the first cases we talked about. Um, it was one of the first cases that we sort of worked up uh, because I think I don't think this case can be discussed enough. Um, I know, you know, some people are like, oh, everybody talked about my trees. Let's move on to something else. Well, you know, this is one where it's not just entertainment. I think this is a case where people need to keep talking about it and they need to keep talking about the failures and how the system failed my trees. I don't, unfortunately, if my trees was murdered, um, I don't think we'll ever bring that person to justice. I hold out hope that one day something will happen, like we said, and somebody will crack and they'll talk. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think the thing that we can do and the best thing we can do for my trees and to bring justice to her and to make this tragedy have meaning uh, is to keep highlighting what went wrong and try and make sure that, you know, the next person who finds himself and her situation is treated better uh, by the police. And I think that's definitely something that her mother and her family have have tried to do is to make sure that at the end of the day, my trees did not die in vain. You know, and how botched this particular investigation was, uh, I'm not saying necessarily that because this police department did it, it means that all police departments are corrupt or bad at their jobs. No, in fact, I don't think I've ever seen this level of incompetence, negligence, whatever you want to call it, in any of the cases that I've prosecuted. And um, I, I'm not even sure that this is how the LAPD or the LASD uh, typically do their investigations. I hope not. Um, so I'm hopeful that, th as sad as it is, Mitrice's case is an outlier. Um, but this is this is not uh, this is not acceptable. The type of uh, work that was done on this investigation. Yeah, to leave you with a little bit of. Uh, the bright side of this, like Alice said, this is not what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Like we are not seeing this uh, in the agencies we work with and the police departments we work with, the officers that we work with. This is not typical. This is not the way it is, and it's not the way it should be. Um, and like Alice said, hopefully to the extent, you know, there's anybody out there, any police departments acting this way, my Teresa's case has been one that people are looking at and are using it in training and they're using it as an example of what not to do when faced with these kinds of cases. Yeah, absolutely. I guess we'll add our voices to the calls for uh, a reinvestigation. Well, Alice, that one, that, that, this is a heavy case. Um, I'm glad we did it. I hope people, you know, enjoyed is a weird word to say here, but I hope people who hadn't heard about my trees, now know her and know what happened to her. Um, and hey, maybe somebody out there who's listening has some information. If you do, there are several websites. I would actually recommend contract contacting the family if you're willing to do that uh, and then contacting the police uh, just because in this one, I just don't trust the police. Um, but I do hope if anybody does have any information, they'll come forward. Reach out to us. Let us know what you thought about this episode. If we, we, you know, we didn't talk about everything in this case. This, this is a pretty big case. Um, you really, like I said, check out that Los Angeles magazine, uh, 
uh, profile on this case. It's fantastic. Uh, it's really good. It goes into a lot more detail than we did. We will link it on the website. That's prosecutorspodcast.com. Reach out to us at prosecutorspod, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and then you can email us at prosecutorspod at gmail.com. All right, Alice. I guess that's all we got for today. Glad you were able to get your microphone to work. Next week, hopefully, the uh, the microphone will still be working as we look at a new case, new questions, hopefully better police work, and new answers. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutor. Talk a little bit more, see how that is. Taking you off speaker, I'm still talking. Is that loud enough? I think it's loud enough. Yeah, let's try this. Okay. I'm sorry if this is crazy. Okay. We'll try. We'll <laughs> I'm try. really sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why everything's going wrong today. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna try and maintain my zen today. Why? Did you think you were too? I don't know. I feel like I was. I was raving. Before you, you were pretty angry, but you know, there's. there's Oh, I see.